Welcome to Personal Landscapes. I'm your host, Brian Murdoch. You can find links for today's episode and other conversations on books about place at ryanmurdoch.com. When I hiked through the accursed mountains in Kosovo, Montenegro, and Albania last June, I met older Albanians who still referred to Edith Durham as their mountain queen. I'd stumbled across a copy of her 1909 book, High Albania, while preparing for the trip, and I was immediately hooked by her descriptions of a tribal society where families lived in defensive stone towers and blood feuds were governed by a centuries-old canon of customary laws. She crisscrossed the Balkans on foot, horseback, and sometimes in disguise at a time when this was one of the most isolated parts of the continent. Her book provides a rare first-hand look at a turbulent corner of Europe during the last years of the Ottoman Empire. I'm joined by Durham's biographer, Marcus Tanner, a London-based writer and editor at Balkan Insight. He first encountered Edith Durham as a journalist writing about the Kosovo War. A colleague passed him a dog-eared copy of High Albania and said everything that's happening now was predicted in this book. I hope you enjoy our conversation about this remarkable traveler who plunged into the world of great power politics to fight for the right of a small fledgling nation to be treated with the same consideration as the strong. Marcus Tanner, welcome to Personal Landscapes. Hello. So I first encountered Edith Durham uh, earlier this year while preparing for a trip to the Balkans, and I was vaguely aware of her name, but I'd never read her before. So who was Edith Durham and why did she go to the Balkans? She was uh, belonged to a very large family, as was common in the Victorian period. Her father was a surgeon in London, a very dynamic and sort of progressive, but very temperamental person. Um, he died young, unfortunately, leaving some nine children. And being a sort of liberal progressive family, it was considered quite ordinary for Edith's siblings to all start doing very interesting things. The boys uh, went on scientific explorations all over the world, one joined the military. Uh, and Edith's sisters also were among the sort of pioneering first generation of women students at university. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, even in the most liberal and progressive household, there's always someone who has to stay behind with mother. And um, that was Edith. And she was absolutely furious and hated this business of uh, living with an invalid mother. Her mother was ailing. And in the end, she had a sort of nervous breakdown. And the family reluctantly had to agree to let poor Edith go, go away for a while. So she just hightailed it off to uh, the Balkans via, she stopped off in Croatia, which was then part of Austria-Hungary, but was kind of bored and disappointed. She found it all too civilised and she was obviously hungering for that kind of Victorian explorer life. And she found she could get it by just going over the border to, to the Ottoman Empire, which was astonishingly unexplored apart from the main travel routes. I mean, everyone knew Constantinople and the big cities. But travellers had been very few and far between to to what's now Republic of Albania uh, or to Kosovo. So she was really kind of treading on virgin land and was hugely excited about it and was clearly influenced by that whole late Victorian cult of the lost world because what really gripped her was this idea that she discovered a kind of lost world which hadn't been affected by any of the main currents of civilization and which could therefore give us an idea of what she would have called primitive man was like. So how did those early travels um, help to establish her reputation, that first trip into Bosnia-Herzegovina and these regions? She didn't just stick around in, um, in Albania. She had to go home. And so but it wasn't a kind of question of being constantly kind of traveling around uh, the Balkans in a kind of extended mission. What she arranged was a kind of setup where she'd go home and deal with mother for a few months a year. In return, she had to be allowed to go on her travels. So she wasn't just limited to Albania. She went to Serbia also, and she made that, interestingly, given her anti-Serbian reputation and credentials later, later on, she made Serbia the first subject of a book. It created quite a splash. Because people hadn't even, although people, even fewer people had been to Albania, Serbia was pretty cut off. It didn't really like foreign visitors. It was a complicated, uh, bureaucratic process to get in the country. And it was even harder to get around it because it was a cult of spies. 
So if you're a Westerner, you tended to be kind of followed around by rather hostile people. For that reason, her book on Serbia sort of established her reputation. And that was her sort of her first public splash. And it was one she sort of disowned later on because she became so anti-Serbian that in later life, she sort of never referred to this book she'd written, which had created such a stir, partly because it was so admiring of Serbia. So this was um, Through the Land of the Serbs. And, and you write at the at the time that it was published, she had quite a different um, quite a different feeling about it. You write that uh, from now on, she wished it to be understood that she was not just another lady traveler in the Balkans with an easel and a private income. In her own mind, at least, she had graduated into a different league and become an authority on Balkan questions. So why why was that important to her to be seen as something other than just this traveler? Oh, I think it was because of her family background. I mean, she was obviously dealing with a sort of competition with these extremely scientific and adventurous brothers and with these very industrious and intellectual sisters. It was pretty important to the kind of, to someone from her kind of background, which wasn't your conventional Victorian churchy background. It was the new liberal forward thinking background that she came from. And I think she needed to justify herself in her own mind with, you know, given the, Given the fact that you know she was a surgeon's daughter, her father was you know quite intellectual. They were all. It was you're talking about a clever family. So I think just to have kind of gained a reputation as someone doing watercolors in Balkans, you know, peasant standing against a well, that kind of thing. Lots of pictures, jewelry. No, that wasn't enough. She did like to do the painting, but she considered herself an ethnographer first, and very quickly began forming kind of strong political opinions about the Balkans. And again, that marked her out from the kind of average Victorian English woman traveller who tended not to concentrate on politics at all, but just sort of dwelled in the, on the sort of intricacies of the harem and all that kind of stuff. And Edith was like, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm talking about rearranging boundaries here. I'm talking about what states should look like. I want to meet kings and politicians. And she did. It's quite incredible. And I wonder if it's also a bit of um, midlife pressure at this time. Like she was, what, 37 when she set out on her first travels? Well, yeah, absolutely. She was, um, you know, distinctly middle-aged by the, you know, the boundaries of her, of the time in which she lived. So, yeah, that was also part of it, I think. And in terms of her political opinions, I mean, this was also a region where not so many people had a firsthand glimpse of what was happening on the ground, right? Like a lot of a lot of these opinion shapers were journalists back in London. They weren't somebody who had first-hand experience of the country and its people. Well, yes, she was a, quite a pioneer in that because when people thought of like Britain and the Albanians, they immediately thought of Byron and that kind of era, people who went to visit pashas and sort of wrote about how exotic and, and beautiful the costumes were and all that sort of stuff. And um, no, she definitely sort of immediately inserted herself into a sort of political sphere and in that sense she was as you say she was quite a pioneer I mean there were some journalists on the ground like in Bulgaria there was a sort of famous English journalist who was there for years and you know immersed himself in Bulgarian politics but as you say most of them tended to be writing out of Vienna or they kind of whooshed through and I think that defined Edith's career her insistence that she was talking about people she'd met on the ground and she wasn't she liked to talk to the king of montenegro she was uh, that became her speciality um <laughs> you know her relationship with the court of montenegro was long and complicated and quite intimate but she also was very determined to balance that out with the fact you know with her her ear to the ground and she felt very strongly in later life and that's partly why she became so bitter that her ear to the ground was ignored and that people preferred the views of so-called Balkan specialists who were based in London and who sort of arranged countries and fixed borders, but without, in her view, taking any notice of what people on the ground wanted. And she felt that that was um, why Albania was slighted and treated badly, because it didn't have enough influence with those important Western policymakers. She was very concerned about the people who live there, whereas these policymakers were concerned about great power politics. Exactly. They were concerned with forming states that suited France and suited Britain rather more than, yeah, and they were very, tended to be pretty, dis- I mean, that was not just their fault, that was the attitude of the times. Uh, you know, it was for the for the best educated people in Western capitals to decide what was best for people in the East. 
And this was a particularly turbulent region as well. Like your, your book is much more than just a biography of Edith Durham. It, it's also sort of a, a primer in the history of this convoluted area. And I, it's really difficult to get to grips with that in a short podcast like this one, but to oversimplify it enormously, why was the Balkans so turbulent? Um, because you had two great empires that were both um, in rapid decline, and it was sort of questionable which one was going to fizzle out first. So, you know, ever since um, the late Middle Ages or even earlier, you know, the Ottoman Turks had held the whole of the Balkans pretty much. And then Austria became stronger and especially in the 17th and 18th century began moving in and taking slices of that empire. But then the real trouble began when Austria also began to kind of crack up in the 19th century. So it no longer became a question of Turkey receding and Austria advancing and all the countries still remaining under foreign rule. Suddenly it became a question of, oh, we can liberate ourselves. You had this rise of nationalism all throughout, um, especially from 1848 onwards, all throughout the Balkans, Bulgarians, Croats. I mean, Serbs had a particularly strong sense of identity, which they preserved under the Ottomans. All these kind of bubbling, you know, these ideas bubbling away under the surface suddenly became about, you know, suddenly you're dealing with countries that could start wars. You know, not just, you're not just talking about peasants, kind of local peasant uprisings, which the Austrians and the Ottomans knew how to deal with. You're talking about kind of nations now being formed and nations forming armies. The whole thing was very much up for grabs because, of course, the problem with nationalism is that nearly always each nation considers its own borders in a maximum, in the maximum line. And so they all overlapped. And some were further ahead than others. Serbia was already a state. So they already had an army. And they already had schools. And they were building railways. And that, well, that was what fascinated Edith when she went to Serbia. She couldn't believe how sort of quickly it was advancing. And she was hugely impressed by these sort of blocks of military barracks and railway stations and crocodile processions of children going off to school. I mean, that's what really fascinated her. She thought, my goodness, this, is, this isn't just some kind of Ruritanian land. This is a country on the make. And then what horrified her far more was when she went to Albania, still ruled by the Ottomans, and saw how little of that was happening. And that's what made her frightened, because she had a strong sense of justice. I think what really shocked her and frightened her was this idea that, oh my goodness, the Serbs have got armies and railways and soldiers everywhere. And across the border in the Ottoman Empire, you have these Albanians who haven't even got roads. So she was shocked. There were no schools, no roads that were very passable. I mean, if you read her diaries, which I did, and which was the sort of backbone of of the book I wrote about her, the time it took her to get you know, across this tiny country was extraordinary. You're talking about a day to get up a hill because it's just mud and she's on the donkey and the donkey keeps sliding back. I mean, it was absolute torture. Why was it so undeveloped? Why did the Ottomans not do anything in these regions except conquer them? Is it just because they were in decline? Well, the Ottomans had... Yeah, they had a strangely ambivalent relationship with the Albanians. They, in some senses, they preferred them. You know, huge numbers of Albanians went off to, the, you know, the center of the empire and rose very high. You know, they became viziers and really senior court officials. But while the Ottoman Empire liked to kind of suck out and if, if, if it felt like it promote Albanians, they didn't really want to put anything back there in case the Albanians lost that kind of uh, tradition of seeking betterment in Mm -hmm. Constantinople. You know, the idea was always to draw the Albanians in because they're mostly Muslim. You know, it was a strangely kind of multi-confessional country for the Balkans where usually there's a sort of fixed religion of the people. Serbia was orthodox, full stop. But Albania wasn't like that. It was sort of overwhelmingly Muslim, but there were also significant Catholic and Orthodox minorities. So they were, they were on a different kind of level of consciousness and they tended to look elsewhere, not to the Ottoman Empire. But the Muslim majority did look to the Ottomans for preferment. And when you look at the first Ottoman, uh, free Albanian government, Albania finally declared independence. You know, several of the ministers had been ministers in the Ottoman government. 
So even right to the end, there was this very close relationship and a bit of ambivalence. Do we serve the Sultan or do we serve independent Albania? And I think it was, that was a conflict for Muslim Albanians right to the end. She, as this whole region started to fall apart and fracture, she quickly became involved in humanitarian work. And I think the, the first instance was, what, 1903 in uh, Macedonia on behalf of the British Relief Fund. So what, yeah. what did she do there and what did that experience teach her? Well, I think it taught her an enormous amount and it really kind of, she really used that experience later on in Albania. But there was a big uprising in Ottoman, Macedonia was the most conflicted area of the whole the whole lot. It was still under Ottoman rule, but everyone had designs on it. The Greeks said it's Greek, the Serbs said it's Serbian, Bulgarian said no, it's Bulgarian. There was also a large, very large Albanian community there, but as I was saying before, the Albanians were rather behind, a bit retarded in the whole sort of nationalist movement. So there was a big uprising there, which the Ottomans crushed pretty brutally. It was a very short-lived republic declared in a hilltop village called Khrushchevo and uh, it got everyone very excited but the Ottomans moved in and were pretty bloody brutal and Edith who by whom by now had gained a, something of a reputation in London going to her sort of studies of the Serbs she managed to get the job as kind of a head of uh, one of the heads of the relief operation which was based in Ohrid which is now in Macedonia beautiful town in Macedonia so she went there and uh, she learned an awful lot about it because it gave her, it certainly, felt, firstly, it formed some of her opinions even more because England was very pro Bulgarian at that point. There was enormous kind of admiration. It was called the Prussia of the Balkans, and people talked about it a lot, far more than Serbia. It was seen as the coming country. But Edith formed a huge dislike of the sort of uh, Bulgarians while she was managing this relief operation in Macedonia. She thought the Bulgarians had stirred up a revolution in no intention of completing or arming them, and had then left this peasantry to be hunted down. Macedon the Macedonian relief operation brought out the least attractive side of Edith Durham. She worked very conscientiously with these uh, mostly Slav Macedonians in all sorts of things, running hospitals and everything. But she formed a kind of huge dislike for most of them. And I think that's what kind of began tilting her very strongly in the direction of Albania. She found she was a doctor's daughter and she really couldn't handle peasants who preferred to die than eat meat on a fast day. She just couldn't get it. And she was absolutely furious to find out that the nurses who, were her, who she was employing were throwing away the meat because the bishop, you know, the, the Bulgarian bishop, the Bulgarian Orthodox bishop had said, no, 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 no. You mustn't be eating that. And they have innumerable fast days. So she felt her patients were sort of dying. They were absolutely terrified of injections or any kind of medicine. She couldn't get them to take their clothes off because the tradition of the women in Macedonia was you pretty much wore your huge, heavy garb all the time. I mean, quite how they had sex, I don't know, because they really were reluctant to get take their clothes off. And Edith caused a huge scandal when she was there because she was spotted in a sort of nightgown, which was take, t trying to take a bath. And this went round that she must be some kind of prostitute because no Macedonian woman bathed. They just kind of put little drops of water on their hands. Yes, it was a bit of a mixed experience. It gave her an immense kind of amount of uh, experience about how to run a relief operation. That really came into play when Mal Al Albania finally became independent 10 years later. And Edith is remembered in Albania as having supported Albanian independence and waved the flag and lobbied countries uh, to recognise Albania. But actually, her bigger work, really, was that she ran, an, an, on her own this time, an enormous relief operation. Because when Albania declared itself independent, Serbia moved in to grab Kosovo. There was an enormous flow of people out of Kosovo, people living in the open air. There was a massive amount of typhus. And Edith knew what to do. She just, she got hold of blocks of dried soup from the Italian army. She sort of lobbied everyone. She got hold of sort of American businessmen. There was someone called Mr. Crane who gave her a vast amount of money. And she just sort of met him in, on a boat or something. So she really worked hard to kind of, um, to run her own relief operation at this time and saves a huge number of people. And one of the reasons why a huge crowd came out to see her when she went back to what was then an independent Albania in 1921, 
it was not because she lobbied for Albanian independence. It was because she she'd saved their lives. So this Macedonian relief thing operation that she took part in was hugely important. And also she brought to it the, not, her, the knowledge as a surgeon's daughter. She wrote that she wasn't afraid of sawing people's legs off. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting that she was so interested in ethnography and had such an understanding of, um, of these cultures and she was such a keen observer of it. But at the same time, she'd become so furious about, like she couldn't find a way to get to people to overcome those prejudices about, you know, needles or the things that were stopping them from getting healthy again, the fast days and things. I suspect she was extremely impatient. I mean, <laughs> you know, when you, have, when you hear descriptions about her, especially in later life, people found her a pretty startling kind of person. And they found her kind of shockingly masculine for the time and, uh, you know, a bit sweary. She didn't correspond to Edward in England's idea of womanhood at all. And I expect that, like, in, also in her dealings with patients and these sort of superstitious Macedonians with their amulets and their terror of eating meat on a fast day, I suspect that she was probably pretty abrupt. She didn't come from that kind of religious background that might have sort of had more sensitivity towards it at all. She was interested in sort of ethnology, but I think she was also very scientific and her father's daughter in that sense. I suppose those... Um those same difficult qualities are what made her such a rugged traveler as well. Because, I mean, the journey she went on was just quite astonishing. She destroyed her health riding around Albania, especially when it became independent in 1913, when, as I said, she found herself in charge of trying to save the lives of tens of thousands of people, and which she organized with military efficiency. I mean, she didn't just get the dried soup, but she, she realized they needed roofs, you need to get kind of tarpaulin, get huts rigged up, tend to a hut, all this sort of stuff. I mean, she had it all worked out. But she was doing this in kind of terrible weather a lot of the time. I mean, it wasn't put in sort of hot summer. It was often in um, sort of autumn and winter. And she didn't have great health to begin with. Um, and her arthritis, she had a problem with her leg pretty early on from a fall. So she one, leg, like slightly, one leg was slightly shorter than the other. So she had pain with that, and she became very arthritic. Basically, she was by the time she left and got back to England, she was sort of almost disabled, really. But again, I think it's interesting that that she was a person of her time. Um, now that would be considered a sort of shocking sacrifice, but in her era, in that sort of Protestant, in, you know, Victorian culture. I think she's sort of, you know, it was, it was more seen as par for the course. You know, you do your duty. And she felt that was her duty. She had a duty to the Albanians. As you mentioned, that her, she's best known today for her writing on Albania. Yeah. And her first, her first visit was um, to Skodra, over the border from uh, Montenegro. The description she writes here of the wild men of the mountains, clad in striped legs and sheepskins, heavily armed with magnificent silver weapons and girdled with cartridges the handsome Christian Albanian women from the mountains in more clothes than you can imagine. It's like a description from some forgotten age, but this is 1901. Yeah, it does sound like Shangri-La. And I think that's why um, she didn't realize that the world that she had sort of discovered, or I mean, she wasn't totally alone, but she was you know, one of the few discoverers, was about to vanish so fast. And I think that's what really shocked her towards the end of her life when she came back to a free Albania in 1921, as I said before. And she was just appalled because this culture that she that had seemed so impregnable, this lost world of people who had no contact with all these sort of outside civilizational currents that had so excited her, it crumbled with incredible speed. Hmm. And it was just vanishing very fast by 1921. And she was just shocked to find she was now in Albania in a world of gramophones and jazz music and women in short skirts and, and kind of cheap imitations of Western fashions. It, it appalled her. And not only her, there were other people also who went to were equally distressed and saddened to see the way this kind of once impregnable looking culture that was so different from anything uh, you'd see elsewhere had, had just sort of fallen away incredibly fast. And it's incredible to think that the, the time between when Edith was discovering that and the communist takeover of Albania, it's only a couple of decades. Mm. You know, within fast forward and you've got Enver Hodger and sort of Stalinist Albania 
with no religion and just sort of tower blocks and concrete and no one wearing anything traditional. So it did vanish very fast. I'm particularly interested in this period of high Albania that this wrote about in the book, high Albania, because that's the area that I was traveling in, you know, with a, when I kind of discovered her, I did a hike through from um, Kosovo to Montenegro to Albania through the accursed mountains uh, last summer. So some of the same territory that she wrote about here. Oh, really? So she made three separate expeditions into the accursed mountains yes. over what about an eight month period. And she was probably one of the first Britons to venture into this area, which was, you know, one of the most remote, cut off, undeveloped areas in, in all of Europe. She keeps noting that in her diary. I'm the first woman from Europe, from Western Europe, to visit this village. She describes it as a land of the living past, like a, a place that influences like the, the Reformation, the Counter Reformation, you know, the Enlightenment had just passed by without without even touching upon it. Or, you know, a taste of what Europe might have been like thousands or 2,000 years ago before the advent of Islam or Christianity or the rise of nations. So could you describe some of this world that you found in, in the Accursed Mountains? I mean, this land of blood feuds and the canon. And- it was a, a particularly interesting society. She was moving mainly in this kind of minority Catholic world of North Albania. I don't think she had so much of a handle or a sympathy for the Muslim Albania that was actually the majority of the population and, and who she sort of regarded as too much penetrated by outside influences. By She wasn't anti-Islamic, but she was aware she didn't find um, such a sort of strangeness and an, an, and an aloneness in that part of Albania. But in those northern mountains, she was really fascinated by this very tribal world and their unique um, codes of ethics and behaviour and she was often accused of being bloodthirsty. I, I mean, it's why the, she's, the reviews of her book started going down, because it was all very well writing, oh, Serbia's a nice country, and it's got full of relations. That, that was very interesting. But when she started going into detail about these uh, vicious blood th- feuds between the northern Albanian mountain tribes, this eye-for-an-eye culture, which was all based on what was called the canon of Le- Dukjanin, Duk- I can't quite pronounce it, Dukajin, and which was whether he existed or not, it was it was a kind of collected code of wisdom that governed their behaviour, and which in many ways was just a sort of Old Testament like culture, really based on sort of reprisals. She was absolutely fascinated by that, but but writing about it in detail gave her a bit of a, a bad press in Britain because people thought it was she was sort of revelling in it, whereas it, she wasn't revelling in it. She was actually re- very opposed to it. She thought it was it had done enormous damage to the Albanian cause instead of rising all in a lump, as she once put it. They never rise all in a lump. You know, they don't have a Garibaldi. That was what she often said. And instead of doing that, they sort of rose against in little lumps against each other. And she it was a, it was the scientist in her that got her sort of documenting all these codes and codes of behavior. It wasn't because she sort of approved of them, but she was absolutely fascinated by it and she was particularly fascinated by their their casual attitude to religion which i think is what again made her feel oh i've come across the people who really haven't been penetrated by these great world religions so although they were nominally catholic you know she found they were sort of um incredibly casual in most of their religious beliefs didn't have any idea whatever what the holy spirit was or anything like that and if they did they thought it was a bird that literally kind of flew out <laughs> i just remember how in one of her encounters she asked some kind of young peasanty guy what he thought the holy spirit was and he started flapping his arms like a kind of <laughs> bird and running around and it was this kind of attitude that i think it not only interested her scientifically it kind of tickled her that's why she liked these people so much. She found them free spirited because they hadn't, she didn't really sympathize with religion hugely. But ironically, to get through to those people, she had to hang around a lot with the Catholic clergy in Northern Albania, who were often foreign, often German or Swiss or something. And she found them interesting people. She, she, you know, she respected them. But I think what really appealed to her about those Northern Albanian tribes was their kind of idiosyncratic and rather casual attitude to religion, and which she found so refreshing after the heavy-duty superstitions that she'd encountered in, encountered in Ohrid and in Macedonia, which she felt was suffocating and, and stupid. The sense really comes across in her in her writing how much she how much she liked the people and uh, 
the sense that she would much rather be sitting in a tower house in a stone tower house somewhere in the mountains than around, you know, some posh uh, Pasha's palace in, in Skodra or one of these places. Plus, I think the other thing that she really liked about is these Northern Albanian tribesmen and their culture, and I say tribesmen with an emphasis, she didn't really hang around with any of the women, was because she could escape her kind of sex. You know, in England, she was a spinster, and spinsters had an allotted role. You know, you helped in church with the flowers. A woman with her class would have joined, would be on the board of some kind of charity to do with the poor. And Edith just revolted against that whole idea. But in the Northern Albanian mountains, this world of where the sexes were so divided, because they really didn't have that much to do with each other, the men associated with the men and the women were just left right in the background. She felt accepted as a kind of honorary, as an honorary guy. And I think she really liked that. She liked sitting, doing the powwows with these half naked kind of guys with the sweat. I mean, she wrote once in a, in a letter that I thought was rather revealing. She wrote in great, very great detail about the beads of sweat dripping down this kind of muscular man's chest, which I thought was interesting because when I was asked to Albania, I was invited to Albania to talk about that book once. And I was asked, oh, was she a lesbian? And I thought, I don't think... Uh, someone who wasn't sexually interested in men would have written those descriptions of rippling muscles and sweat dripping down the kind of, you know, I thought, no, 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 she definitely, she, she found them physically attractive. She found them attractive. They were fit and strong and yeah. And she liked being included in their company, which she wouldn't have been in England. She wasn't included in, and that was always her problem. When she went back to England, she found herself back again, being treated as a silly old spinster. Women, you know, can't be taken seriously. They, whereas in Albanian men did take her seriously, and she really liked that. Well, there was also sort of a niche or a place for her in the canon with uh, this concept of uh, sworn virgins, which that's quite interesting. Yes. Although I'm not sure she sort of identified too much with the sworn virgins. I think she quite would like not to have been a virgin, actually. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure she was ready to sign up. She, you know, she might have remained one. I'm not sure it was voluntary, but she was obviously very interested in that whole business. Of, yes, these weird, these, you know, this extraordinary tradition in that part of the world whereby women could escape this life of complete servitude and just, you know, wash, just total background existence, never being invited to meals or anything like that. Literally, just bringing up children. That was it. You could escape all of that if you took this perpetual vow, this vow of perpetual virginity, in which case you swap your, your dress for men's clothes and you, you were given a gun, which you couldn't have as a woman, and um, you joined the boys and you could own land. And she met a few of them and was, was rather fascinated and she was amused that to be dis- dismissed as what she called a petticoat by the swarm virgin she, she met who just sort of took one look at her and drawled on a cigarette and turned away thinking... Just, you know, I don't need to deal with you. But so, yes, she was, she was kind of fascinated by that. It's remarkable how deeply the, the blood feud penetrates these, uh, all of her travels. Like she, she talks about you know, going from one village to the next and you, you would be given an escort from that family who's under whose personal protection you were. If somebody would have um, robbed her or shot her on the way between that village and the next, that man's family would then be responsible for enacting vengeance against against the other family. So yeah. it was part of every, every aspect of life is quite interesting. Or she'd vi- visit one house and they can't go outside because, you know, they're taking pot shots at the neighbor who happens to be in a feud with them. And they, yeah, and they perpetuated themselves sort of forever because you never got, there was never a sort of timeout period. It didn't expire. It was all, everyone, everyone identified with their family, their clan. So, the, you know, the bill, the cost, the price lay upon the clan. It didn't disappear if, if the offending person sort of emigrated or something. The family had to bear the consequences. And she was totally fascinated by this, but also absolutely appalled. She thought it had enormously hindered Albania and done untold damage. And she was uh, hugely interested in attempts to stop it. But she did like to chronicle it. That was the scientist in there. She wanted to know exactly what the rules were. Have you read uh, Ismail Kadare's novels about the mountains? Not really. But he talks about um, a young a young man whose brother had been killed, you know, by the neighboring family, and he was being pressured to to enact vengeance once he once he came of age or whatever. And uh, he did eventually kill the the guy from the other family, and now his time his days are numbered. Like he's 
it's inevitable that somebody will come and and Mm. shoot him in return. And he had done nothing to become, everybody had forgotten what the initial cause of this thing was, but just perpetuated down the generations. Oh, yes, they went on forever. So people couldn't remember at all what it originally started all off. Yeah, to the point where even, you know, if you, you'd have to kill a male relative of this of this other family, it could be a little kid even. And people would just yes, shrug and say, well, it's a- terrible that somebody shot this kid, but it's the tradition. Mm. And, you know, there was the, the blood prize. Yeah, yeah. And it's amazing to think how recent this was, you know, 19, what, 1909, 1908. Yes, I think it probably went on. I mean, I've been on this uh, website that I work for, Balkan Insight, you know, we've done stories on... There are lingering sort of traces of that culture even now after this 50 years of communist, Stalinist-style communism, which really stamped on all traditions. So, yeah, it was pretty hard to root up. I was particularly uh, interested in her journey to um, to Gusinja, up up over the mountains. I walked through that same pass on, on the way back, the, the same pass that she, she had crossed through in 15 feet of snow. And, yeah. And made this raf- this journey into this forbidden, like the Lhasa of yeah. its day, basically. That's quite an amazing story. Which I, yes. she had met, she'd been trying to get to this town that nobody had been to. It was in, I think it was a Muslim-controlled town. She was in a Catholic area, and they were few, they were about to declare war on each other. But she met a, a priest who said, oh, "I can, I can take you there." And somebody from the neighboring town of Vicenia uh, invited her to their place. So they they set out over the mountains. The priest, her, and and another guy, like a helper, her her, her escort. And it, it turned out to be this, this, the pass is incredible. It's, it just corkscrews. Like I came from the other direction from, from Montenegro to uh, Teth, but going down to Teth, it's just a straight sheer drop corkscrewing down a mule path. Did you go to- yeah. Yeah. I came from, uh, well, I started in Kosovo and then I went into Montenegro. So I came from Vicinia over to Teth, same route, but in, in reverse. It, it looks very beautiful. I've only seen pictures of it. I've seen, it looks very. Yeah, it's absolutely incredible. Yeah. Yeah. The, the mountains, it's so remote and this, this high pass, it opens up into all these meadows and there, you see remnants of the concrete bunkers from the and, and Rahaj's time mm. um, and some abandoned military facilities. And then there's a border marker, a, a crumbling you know, concrete pyramid uh, on the border of Montenegro and Albania in this beautiful open valley with the mountains, karst mountains up towering up each side. But to, to walk the same territory that she had walked and written about in this book, that was really... I think the highlight of that hike for me. And I think, unfortunately, those mountains are pretty empty now because there's been such a mass migration to the cities in Albania, even more than in the other parts of the Balkans. Well, the the town of uh, Teth seemed to be experiencing a bit of a revival as an outdoor centre. I think some of them are, yes, doing a bit of work on getting those sort of mountains. Teth and Valbona, they were the only places I saw other people on this hike. Yeah. Um, they, they just had a paved road open to Teth, I think, the year before. So you, you'd meet hiking groups and things like this, where previously, like in the other stretches, I was completely alone all the time. I didn't see anybody. So High Albania is her best-known book today. It's the only one you're likely to find with any ease. But how was it received at the time that she wrote it? Well, I th- it was received kind of respectfully. Because as I was hinting at before, it, it sort of marked a beginning in a slide in her sort of reputation because people found it gory. In the period, in that period that she was writing, we're talking about Edwardian now, right, Victorian England. If you wrote about those things, I think readers, it, the English middle class readership, they expected moral judgment. A lot of reviews are, are sort of harp on that theme about why is why is she why is a woman writing about all this stuff, and if she is, why isn't she sort of pointing out how wicked it is? Whereas well, you know, he did disapprove of it, but she didn't. That wasn't the way she wrote. She was very much a kind of into reportage. I think she was a bit of a head. She was ahead of her time in her writing. I mean, other, her contemporaries' books and Balkans often seem incredibly flowery and overly judgmental and sort of ooing and aahing about sort of sexual practice or whatever. That just wasn't Edith Stahl. But that's actually why, ironically, although sadly she didn't live to see it, her book has sort of sold and sold and sold and sold. It's been reprinted an enormous number of times. Precisely because it seems so modern. And there was a great upsurge of interest in it at the start of the Kosovo conflict, which is when I first read it, because her judgments on, I mean, she did make some judgments, but political judgments, not moral ones. And her, you know, political kind of prognostications about Kosovo were just so prescient. It was extraordinary. I mean, they, you just felt, oh my goodness, mm-hmm. it's going to be written last week. 
And this was in the late 1980s, which is when I first started reporting on the trouble that was starting up in Kosovo. Yeah, you had a really good description of that in your book. You wrote that High Albania contains vivid descriptions of life in Albania and Kosovo around you know, circa 1909, but many old travel guides have that quality. It was the unnervingly contemporary feel of her 80-year-old descriptions of Mitrovica, Pristina, and other parts of Kosovo. She was insistent on the primacy of uh, ethnic issues, it sound, which sounded anachronistic at the time, but but history proved her right. You know, she felt that ethnic issues were more important than class or... Well, yeah, that's because like in the 1980s and 70s, especially, you know, before communist Yugoslavia dissolved. I mean, if you look back at those uh, historic, you know, the books that were written at the time about Yugoslavia, they were very much tended to be usually written from the left, analyzing the socialist, socialist experiment in Yugoslavia. So they gave enormous kind of interest to what this... This philosophy of self-managing socialism, which was what the Yugoslav credo was, which is quite difficult to unpack. But I mean, that's what all the interest was in. And people kind of rather sidelined. I mean, they were, of course, they were aware of ethnic tensions. No one could ever go to Yugoslavia even in the 60s, 70s or 80s without acknowledging them. But I think what, yeah, it was that they didn't give that primacy, which Edith insisted was going to be the issue. And she was she was right about that. And not just saying, oh, in a general way. She because she'd been on, on the ground so much, she was she didn't just say, oh, this is going to be the issue. She said, this here, this Mitrovica, this town, this is where it's problematic. And it was just extraordinary that when the war started in Kosovo in the late 1990s, it ended with a sort of ethnic front line right through the middle of this town where you'd been and she'd said, this is where it's going to, this is where the Serbian Sea and the Albanian Sea are going to meet and overlap and clash. It was absolutely right. Today, Kosovo is divided between the vast majority of it, which is Albanian-controlled, right up to the, to the river running through Mitrovica, and the northern sliver is Serbian. And she understood that. For, for people who don't know that or who don't remember the Balkan Wars, what's the importance of Kosovo to the Serbians? Well, it's immense, and that's, that's part of the tragedy of the region. It's not the same as like when the English got chucked out of Ireland in the First World War. I mean, there was a huge collective shrug and then everyone sort of moved on because it was never considered the heart of England. It was a sort of colonial domain. But the Serbs didn't, don't consider Kosovo a colonial domain. They consider it their ancestral homeland where things all began. And Ethnic uh, specialists sort of hum and haw about that, and some say, well, actually, it wasn't quite as central to medieval Serbia as people suggest. But there's no doubt that, you know, it was in the early Middle Ages in or near the heart of the then Serbian kingdom. And there are some pretty fine monasteries and ecclesiastical buildings that testify to that presence, and they have enormous significance to Serbia. So it's a kind of humiliation that they, the Serbian population and definitely its political leaders can't and won't shrug off which is why they keep sort of poking at it because you had this popular uprising by the Albanian majority when they became a majority again is disputed but probably in the 18th century Serbs began leaving Kosovo and moving north into what was then Hungary which was an easier better place to live and they were invited in by the Austrian emperors so a lot of them went there and the Albanians definitely started moving over the mountains from Albania proper into Kosovo during that period en masse. So it became, it's one of those very complicated situations where you have a country that claim, lays claim to a province or a region or an area where they don't actually have many of their own people. And at the time Durham was traveling in Kosovo, that was majority Albanian at that time. Yeah. And that's why she was a bit shocked because she'd started out in the Balkans, as I suggested earlier, as kind of mainly writing about Serbia. That was her forte. That was her speciality. That's what gave her fame. So she became known as a sort of Serbian champion, which she was a bit reluctant to sort of acknowledge. She didn't particularly want to be. She just thought of herself as writing, saying this is what's happening there. But she was taken up as a sort of Serbian champion by many Serbs. And she felt rather embarrassed on her first trip to Kosovo that to meet these sort of Serbian clergy and things and be embraced by them and hailed as their great friend in England. But in fact, her mind was rapidly changing because it was on that first trip to Kosovo that she realised that there aren't that many Serbs around and that the vast majority of the territory 
you know, was Albanian and massively so. Not not in some 50, 55, 45 cents, but like, you know, 80, 20 or whatever. So she felt sort of embarrassed to be courted as this kind of friend of the Serbs in the West by then, because she, she started realizing that there was a complete disjunction between the Serbian claim to Kosovo and um, the reality on the ground. And in, and in High Albania, she sort of famously says it's a bit like, the, you know, the English claiming Calais, which we lost in, I don't know, 13, 40 or whatever it was. <laughs> Oh, no, no, it wasn't. It was a bit later than that. It was on the Mary Tudor. 1540 or something. 1550s. Anyway, she likened it to that as a completely unrealistic claim and was disturbed by that. She knew that there was going to be big problems there because Serbia was a coming, you know, a rising force. And it was, you know, becoming in a position to sort of enforce its demands. And she was sort of horrified by the fact that how unrealistic it was. And she knew it would cause immense suffering, which it did, because when Serbia did take Kosovo in 1913 in the Balkan Wars, you know, it resulted in a very oppressive system on the ground, because that was the only way that Serbia could control it. And why did she take so strongly to the Albanian people? Was it a sort of an underdog situation? Like she seemed she sided with the Catholics in the in the highlands of Albania rather than the, the majority Muslim. She always had to seem to have a thing for the for the small person or the underdog. She def- I, I think that's absolutely it. I wouldn't even need to sort of clarify what you've just said. She had, she was a, a person of her time. She had that sort of strong, I mean, people take pot shots at the sort of Victorian English morality, but it wasn't all fake, you know, it wasn't all self-serving. It might have been, in, you know, when imperialist land grabs, were, <laughs> you could say about that, but there were also a hell of a lot of people in her in her cohort, who they were products of this very Protestant culture, and they were no longer really religious themselves, but they'd inherited their parents' moral earnestness. And, you know, they weren't into sort of frivolity in that sense. They weren't into cynicism. So Edith really couldn't stand that sort of uh, what we would call realpolitik. She was, you know, she had a strong sense of justice, which she'd obviously inherited from her sort of parents and their their friends and that culture of seriousness, of Victorian seriousness. And I think that was, um, that really guided her views. She wasn't interested in whether a, a, a free Albania would benefit Austria or damage Russia or help England. She really detested all these machinations. But it also kind of like gave her a certain serenity because one of the things about, I noticed about the very end of her life is that she was really confident in a way that, you know, justice will be done in the end. And I think that that sprang from that feeling of sort of moral earnestness. It gave her this sort of immense conviction about what was right and wrong, but it also gave her a sort of kind of optimism. She refused to be sort of cowed and defeated and say, oh, it's hopeless. It's strange that the Albanians seemed to see something of that in her early on before she had even really done anything. Like she was, she, she made all these expeditions to remote towns and villages and places that nobody from the West, you know, had been to. And they, they sent, they said things like God has sent you to save us. And yeah. Wait, where did that notion come from? They called her the queen. Um, I think they were just totally stunned at anyone who turned up from the Western world. And they assumed she must be incredibly important and must know the kind of the King of England, all that sort of stuff. But uh, yeah, they called her the queen of the mountains and she loved that title. She was really interested in it. She reveled in it. I mean, she didn't take it too seriously. She wasn't that pompous, but she did enjoy it. I think it was, you know, no one had gone there. It was as simple as that. I still met people who called her the, the queen of the mountains. This, this man in the coffee shop I encountered at the bottom of, uh, of a mountain near Valbona, he, you know, he, he was telling me about some of the dialects in the mountains. And I said, I'd read about this in Edith Durham's book. And he said, oh, you know, our queen of the mountains. Yes. There, there still seemed to be some reverence for her. Well, there is. There's a good deal. I think that uh, under the communist period, her name was sort of blotted out. Because you know, Enver Hodge didn't want to acknowledge any foreigners had done anything for Albania. But uh, it did linger on. And when he and his system sort of crumbled away, it was quite a revival of interest in Edith Darwin. You have sort of schools named after her. And I've never met an Albanian who didn't know about her. But so she was a wide re- widely respected authority on the Balkans. And, and she, you know, she was consulted by diplomats for her insights, changed the borders, as you say. But then after 1914, she kind of fell from favor and into obscurity. Why was that? Uh, she was a victim of those big power politics that she so disliked and resented. Edith wasn't remotely 
into it, the sort of anti-German hysteria that sort of began building up before the war, quite some time before, sort of rivalry, you know, stoked by the flamboyant German emperor, no doubt, but which was building up. She had no time for that at all. She was completely uninterested in that kind of bellicose nationalism. So when the war came, and she's still trying to push this old idea of Albania, let's help Albania. But Albania is of absolutely no interest to British foreign policy. They want an alliance with Serbia in established states. So you have the rise of a whole new school of sort of ethnic specialists who are, you know, very pro-Slav. They're very pro the Czechs. They're very pro the Serbs. They're very influential. And so in 1916, you have a huge celebration of Kosovo Day, which I'm afraid is nothing to do with the Albanians in Kosovo. It was, it was, you know, Kosovo Day was brackets Serbian, close brackets Kosovo Day. It was a celebration of Serbian culture and everything. I mean, there was a St. Paul's Cathedral. The Archbishop of Canterbury was there. You know, people were handing out leaflets with the Serbian national anthem on, all that kind of stuff. It was a huge drive to sort of popularise Serbia and our alliance with Serbia. And Serbia was seen as the leading victim of Austro-Hungarian aggression. It, was, it became a sort of martyr country. And the sufferings of the Serbian army in the World War I, which were huge, were you know, widely reported. And Edith's not able to climb on that bandwagon at all. She doesn't want to. So she's really, she's not only sort of shuffled out, she's increasingly kind of criticised and even denounced as pro-German, because she's not saying anything about the evil Germans. She's just banging on about Albania. Yes, her decline in sort of obscurity starts then and doesn't cease. I guess it's no surprise because if the the focus of all these these diplomats and these people are the great power politics and maneuvering for their own benefit. And she was so committed to fairness and you know the rights of a small, weak nation to to govern themselves just as much as a large nation or a strong nation. And not only that, she when in 1913, when the Ottoman Empire in Europe finally collapses and you know, Albania becomes independent, but it's a very small state. And Kosovo, which is mainly Albanian, is left out of it and awarded to Serbia. Um, and when Edith does manage to engineer some kind of border corrections, which is pretty amazing, but they're all on the southern border of Greece, she starts trying to report, this is not something she made up, there were these atrocities taking place in Kosovo and the Serbian army moved in, especially in Peja, Pech, you know, thousands of people were sort of killed. And she's starting, she's trying to kind of get this stuff into the papers, but it looks very bad on about Serbia. And so people are saying, what are you doing? You're writing anti-Serbian propaganda. And, you know, when she once got one article, what was going on there, into one of these new magazines that was set up, you know, in that period, that's sort of 1914, 18 period about the new Europe um, that was going to come. You know, she was sort of crit- uh, denounced uh, by, the, by the editor but, you know, at the end of her article, it says the editor disclaims these opinions or something, you know, something very close to that. I mean, it was like, and she was absolutely humiliated. She saw, you know, she, she was a, by then saw herself as a veteran expert on this region of some 20 years standing. And she writes an article and underneath the authors, the authors of the magazine say, we, you know, we, we don't subscribe to any of this. And not just a veteran, but somebody who'd been on the ground and actually went, went to these places, saw them at first hand and at a time when it was difficult. It was absolutely humiliating for her, and she felt it very bitterly. But that was really the end of her sort of period of getting into the national press. After that, she carries on writing, but they're often for rather pretty obscure publications who don't mind taking mavericks like her. But she's, she's shut out pretty, pretty resolutely. So much so that when Rebecca West writes her famous Black Lamb, you know, Grey Falcons, her own, to Yugoslavia. She takes the time in the book to sort of single out kind of dotty old women who champion nation, na- you know, nations they know nothing about. I mean, it, it's I, I don't have the exact line in front of me, but it's incredibly rude. And it's obviously about her. And you think, for goodness sake. Yeah, and yeah, this is the book most of us are likely to read today. The Black Lamb Grey Falcon is, is far better known. Oh, yes. People still say it's a great work of genius and everything, even though Rebecca West was not really on the ground. I mean, it was done on the basis of, you know, chauffeured trips organised by the Yugoslav government, which is fine. She didn't spend years there and she wasn't on the ground at all. Edith was operating completely independently. I mean, when she got to know the authorities, like she, became, she became a great buddy of the King of Montenegro at one time. But, you know, she'd stroll in at the palace and then stroll out and chat to the peasants. 
it wasn't a sort of managed uh, expedition. How should we remember Edith Durham today? Well, I think she should, she should be remembered more than she is. She really kind of pushed the boundaries of what a late Victorian English woman could do. And just, I think she was immensely courageous to have gone to an area that now is just an hour or two's flight away, and which is extremely well known and covered by travel books, but which is, was as unknown then as North Korea is. I mean, no one had been there. It took enormous guts to set off as, a, you know, an almost middle-aged single person and not only just traverse this region, but to try and sort of change it and help it, and not in a sort of patronising way, but just by lobbying for it in corners of power. So, I, you know, I don't think Edith Durham created Albania or anything, but I, think, I do think she played a pretty heroic and remarkable role in the formation of a, of a new country. And it's a role that no one could do now, because, of course, by the First World War, the age of that kind of personal diplomacy, you know, Edith lobbying the great powers in London on Albanian borders herself, just telegramming, <laughs> saying, no, this is not Greek, this is Albanian. And, they, and not only that, they read the telegram and acted on it. That whole sort of life is became impossible within, you know, only a few years later. It would have been absurd, unthinkable. She's left us with, with this wonderful book, uh, High Albania, which is uh, a first-hand account of the final days of the Ottoman Empire in Europe, culture that would vanish completely soon after. Yeah, that's the other thing that's so important about it. She not only sort of helped create a new country and establish it on the European map, but she recorded this sort of last moments of this world that was about to kind of vanish so quickly, much faster than anyone at the time could have imagined, mm. within a decade. And I think, yeah, we owe a lot to her for that. Thanks for listening to this episode of Personal Landscapes. If you like the podcast, please give it a rating on iTunes and subscribe through your favorite app. You can find links to today's podcast and more conversations on Books About Place at ryanbernard.com. You'll also find a donate button if you'd like to contribute to the costs of the show. All donations are greatly appreciated. Thank you.